Good morning, everybody. So I'll just start it off, and then Neil Schonard will take over. So my name is Dave Flum, for those of you who don't know me. Bold admission, I am not a spine surgeon, but I have a totally awesome spine. And I thought I, I want to give you an update about uh, the Spine Scope Initiative. This is, uh, this is something we've been doing uh, annually. It's a great opportunity for us to really measure ourselves year by year to make sure that we're making the kind of progress that we promise. So, so a raise of hands. Who does not know what Scope is? We'll start there. Good. So we have an opportunity. So I'll do a quick review on what Scope's all about and let you know, uh, let you know about the program and also where it's headed. About three years ago, at this very conference, Peter Fritzell came to us from Europe and said, we challenge you to do what we've been able to do in Europe, to get all of the hospitals and all the surgeons that are working in the spine space together, to really learn from our patients, to create an activity that's beyond a research registry or a quality improvement registry, but a, a learning network where all the docs would learn by what happens to their patients about what they should do tomorrow in the operating room. It turned out that at that meeting, we were able to share with the Europeans what we had built in the general surgical space and then vascular surgical space and pediatric surgical space, a network just like that called SCOPE, the Surgical Care and Outcomes Assessment Program. And we were able to take the notion of a statewide platform where all the hospitals are currently sharing information in surgery, and by building the spine community's interest through surgeons like Neil Schonard and Jens Chapman and many of the people in this room, including the person who just introduced me, Mike Lee, we've been able to build the same activity in, spine, in the spine space. Three years ago, we talked about it as an idea. Two years ago, we gave you the planning information. A year ago, we showed you the early information. And today, we're proud to report that we have 2,000 cases in this registry, moving our way to 4,000 cases, 18 hospitals, which represents about 80% of the surgery in the state of Washington. We're certain that within the next year, this will be a universal platform for you and the spine community in Washington State to learn what's working, what's not working, and, and, and uh, to drive improvements in quality. We're proud to have uh, an update today. This is an initiative that's funded by, in part by the Life Science Discovery Fund. We have representatives from the Life Science Discovery Fund today here with us. And it could not have happened without that fund, but it also couldn't have happened with the support of a lot of philanthropic given, giving from industry, from the Foundation for Healthcare Quality, which is a quality improvement organization in Washington State, and from the spine community. Let me just tell you about this SpineScope uh, platform. The, the platform itself is quite unique. It's driven by clinicians. Clini the, the secret sauce here is that doctors decide which metrics they know are important to track of in the operating room and be before and after surgery, and then convince their hospitals essentially to pay for the gathering of that data. And then that data is pooled and fed back to doctors in the form of benchmarking. The benchmarking is tied to initiatives to change clinical outcomes, initiatives that you'll be hearing about later today, such as the Strong for Surgery campaign, which helps get our patients optimized before surgery. Tying into the last the, this morning's talks, Strong for Surgery is figuring out how often our patients are smoking before we operate on them and do fusions and trying to get them off cigarettes. It's trying to figure out how, what the burden of opioids is on our patients before we fuse them and trying to minimize opioid use. It's tying surveillance about opioid use and cigarette smoking to interventions that actually fix those things. It's not only about research, it's about changing behavior so that tomorrow our patients get, uh, do better in the operating room. The, the initiative is particularly unique in spine because it involves a survey center that gathers patient voices. It's actually called the Patient Voices Initiative that captures the patient's perspective on the care, either pain measures or NDI and ODI, the measures that you know are important before and after surgery. And in that sense, it's the true mark of whether or not the operations we do are making people get better. Scope is a statewide initiative, and I show you this map, and most of you are from Washington, just to point out a couple of things. One, we have a state with urban centers, but a lot of small hospitals and a lot of small communities where creating an initiative that works in every hospital, not just the tertiary and quaternary centers, is essential. If you want to elevate the quality of spine care in Washington state, you need an initiative that focuses on the entire state. Scope is at almost every hospital in Washington state. Spine Scope, in really its first year, has made it to 80% of those hospitals. That's a remarkable feat and something to be proud of. In the end, Scope improves quality, reduces reoperations, length of stay, trips to the ICU, reoperations. But unfortunately, for most people, this is the only slide they care about. Has it been able to impact the, 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 uh, the health economics? We live in a, in, a burden, in a world burdened by the health care costs. This is what it looks look like year by year as Scope has tried to make its impact in hospitals, literally bending the cost curve at hospitals year by year that it's been involved. Now, 
This is not, these are not the numbers for spine scope, but they will be the numbers for spine scope because you know that every reoperation in spine carries a multi, multi, multi tens of thousands uh, cost to the hospital and the system. Now, Neil Schoner is going to come, in, come up in a moment and talk to you a little bit about the data uh, that drove, uh, that, both, that, that, that we now are pulling off the spine scope registry. I just want to talk for a moment about the motivation. Um, you know that there's data that's gathered from each of us uh, on, by the state and by payers about how often our operations result in bad outcomes, usually using lousy billing data. A friend, a colleague of ours named Brooke Martin was able to put together these slides that show all the hospitals in the state and their rates of reoperation by 90 days, these safety outcomes that we worry about, that the state worries about, that payers worry about. So they're also able to look at four-year reoperation rates, and those are, it's a different aspect of variability. It's the variability of who are we operating on. If this is the average right here, 12%, by the way, above the sport trial, look at all these hospitals up here where the, the, the rates of reoperation are much higher than anybody would have imagined. Now, you know that the hospitals have no idea about those rates, and the surgeons at those hospitals have no idea that they're in this space, and the patients have no idea that they're in that space. This is our opportunity as a community to own this variability and to address it, and, and that's what SpineScope is doing uh, in a nutshell. Neil Schonard, a spine surgeon from uh, you know, Pialup, and surgeons from academ academia and the community got together and tried to determine the sorts of metrics that should be in spine scope. Things like safety interventions, like are we measuring the, marking the right level uh, in the operating room with x-rays, verification of the right level in the operating room. Things like risk-adjusted clinical outcomes, and that's hard in the spine space because there's not been a lot of risk adjustment on rates of 30-day reoperation in the spine space. We've had to create some of that risk adjustment. Process of care measures that we all know make a difference for our patients who are, have diabetes or heart disease and the things that need to be done to make sure they have a great outcome. Getting right to the belly of the beast, indications for procedures. You know, one of the main focuses of most initiatives related to spine is who should actually be having a spine operation. That's exactly the kind of information that's in spine scope. And lastly, and I think most importantly, finally gathering the patient reported outcomes that let you know whether or not the operation was worth it or not in the end of the day. That's all the stuff that's in SpineScope, and Neil's going to come up now and talk to you a little bit about our progress and what to look forward to. One last thing, and then we'll come back to this at the end. This is really aimed to be a public health intervention and a public a community activity. This afternoon, the SpineScope Forum, the, the Washington, State, Sp Washington State Spine Forum, meets uh, as part of its regular quarterly meetings. Those meetings are to help you be part of the process. It's an open process where sites will actually get their data back and let be able for the first time to see how they're looking compared to their colleagues. It's also an opportunity to shape the nature of the program, where it's headed, and research initiatives that we're tying in to make the program better. So we look forward to your participation. Hopefully all of you can come this afternoon to the, to the, to the forum. We look forward to you being there. I'll hand, hand it off to Neil now. Thanks, Fred. So this is a, uh, this is a remarkable slide. This is a landmark slide. These are physicians who volunteered to submit data. They were not coerced. They were not forced. They volunteered to submit data. We told you when we were here last time that we would get a pilot done uh, of 1,000 uh, cases by the end of uh, December of last year. We exceeded it a little bit. And what we see now is the rapid growth of spine scope. And we will achieve by the end of uh, this year about 80% of all spine surgeries in the state. And we're going to strive to make sure that every patient who gets operated on, whether they be in a hospital or an ambulatory surgery center, is entered into the registry so we can track the outcomes of what is done. And this is a glimpse into it, and we're just going to glimpse. So uh, the, the data that is in is quite uh, granular. It's very detailed. But as you can see, we are looking at uh, processes that are done intraoperatively, whether they be fusion or not fusion. We're looking at how the approach is done, whether it's done minimally invasive or whether it's done open. We're seeing whether it's an isolated fusion alone. And this allows us to generate the very important information of what outcome the patient had because we know exactly what surgery the patient had. And instead of having administrative billing data where you know date, cost, diagnosis, and procedure, you know all of the intimate details of the surgical procedure from the medical record, and you also know how well the patient do. How well was the patient's pain relieved? How much did their improvement occur from before surgery to after surgery and tracked over time? So you're seeing the value 
the quality of what you do because if you get a good initial improvement and it sustains over time, that's really the definition of value is, and quality is sustained over time. And that's what we're able to do. Now, as Dave was mentioning, this is the belly of the beast. This is what many folks who are stakeholders in the spine space, other than ourselves, other than our patients, there are regulators and there are payers, there are industry members who have, have stake and for them, uh, working in the spine space is critically important to their business. And we're looking at the indications. The best way to look at indications is to take a look at what you've done and track how well it's done and benchmark how well it's done so that you know which indications match beautifully for the surgery and which populations of folks do not do as well. And the indications are not, uh, are not as solid. And this is a slide that reflects actually the Milliman criteria. So the Milliman criteria is an attempt by one of the stakeholders to impose the, uh, the restrictions on spine surgery by saying it has to be done for neurologic symptoms. And if we look at the state of Washington, we're already remarkably compliant with that. But the great thing about this slide is there's variability here. And we'll be able to benchmark the variability to find out in those uh, sites where one out of five patients is having a surgery not for Milliman criteria, how well do they do? And how long do they do that well? So that instead of having the Milliman criteria imposed upon, you have a collaborative discussion about which patient populations do well with which operations and for how long. And if, you're, if you can watch and see, because you look at this stuff quarterly, which population does the best, you can shift and maybe you'll do entirely neurologic fusion surgery. Only patients with neurologic symptoms. But we don't know that yet, but Scope will find it out for us. As Dave mentioned, we have safety metrics, and the simplest one is, is what we consider an always event. There are never events in medicine, and there, this is one of what we consider an always event. For patient safety, every patient should get an x-ray that verifies you are at the proper level performing the proper surgery. And in fact, our locations with relatively high numbers are doing it consistently all the time. And there are other safety uh, metrics, but I'm, I'm just glancing over uh, some of these topics. Dave mentioned and earlier, uh, Dr. Kang mentioned to us that uh, there are modifiable risk factors that significantly impact the outcome of your surgery and the benefit that you're hoping the patient obtains. And those modifiable risk factors, if identified preoperatively, and if you have an intervention and scope allows you to have an intervention to help alter that risk, you can significantly benefit the patient. And here we see across the state of Washington, there's an average of about 30, 33% of patients are undergoing spine surgery and fusion surgery, and I dare say disc surgery, and they are nicotine addicted. And we know that has a devastating impact, and thank you for the greater detail on that earlier this morning, it has a devastating impact on their outcome. Well, imagine if you have a, uh, a public health initiative uh, across the state that says no patient will go to the operating room unless they have gotten rid of that identifiable risk factor. And we'll go over other risk factors, which we can also intervene on at the end of this talk. So uh, the, this is uh, more directed toward the surgeons. We all know that, uh, uh, that there are various ways that we successfully do an operation. All of us were taught this technique. This technique is to take the bone that the patient has and use it, whether you borrow it from another site or you take it from the surgical site that you're operating on, and use it to fuse the spine. And it's considered the gold standard. It's remarkable to notice one out of seven patients has the gold standard operation in the state of Washington. And there's all of this variability in fact, we're using protein, which is designed to be done in the front of the spine, and we're using it in the back of the spine. And spine scope will track this. We'll be able to establish whether there is a safety issue, whether there's a, a, a clinical benefit issue associated with this. Because if you look at these numbers, this number is 1,500 patients. And by the end of this year, it'll be 4,000 patients. So we'll have ample opportunity to have large cohorts in each of these uh, uh, variations to understand which works better. And as David mentioned, we benchmark so you know which technique is more effective and which technique is less effective. And then we transparently give that information back to our 
colleagues and our uh, stakeholders at our forum, which is what we're doing this afternoon, so that everyone knows every quarter which techniques are benefiting, which are the leading way to do things, and we can gravitate toward better outcomes for all of our patients. But some of the things that we do every day, we really should do a better job of. And this is a classic example. This is patients who are diabetic having a blood sugar when they go to the hospital. As you can see, in some of our sites, four out of five patients who are diabetic don't even get a blood sugar when they go in. Uh, in other of our sites, we're highly compliant, but the end numbers are relatively low on those sites. So, but it, as these numbers build, we'll be able to benchmark, we'll be able to give this information back to our hospitals, and hospitals that are not doing as well can find out the nursing protocols of hospitals that are very successful at doing it and move toward getting all of our patients monitored for their blood glucose. And if you look at Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip forward to the uh, patient reported outcomes. This is really the meat of the matter for scope. The meat of the matter for scope is to ask the patient what matters to them. Because a lot of what we looked at back there is what matters to us as stakeholders. But what matters to the patient is, is my pain relieved? Am I returned more closely or all the way back to my regular activities, my full functions, my return to work? Those are the things that are critically important. And as a registry, it's our work in progress. As we can see, some of our sites are very compliant at getting our pain scores. That's the numeric rating pain scale. You have a pain scale from 0 to 10, and how bad is your pain? And some of our sites are doing a great job. Some of our sites are not doing as well. But we, we show this at our forum. We uh, help, help develop mechanisms for interventions for the sites that are not doing as well to get up to where we, because we need this information for our post-operative evaluations. This is your baseline. You have to have it. And when you look at our um, uh, uh, reoperation rates, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, outcomes that are not risk adjusted. So if you're a site, a hospital, say your, your hospital number, uh, sorry about that, say your hospital number or letter uh, G, and you say to yourself, geez, I've got high volume but I've got a, a very high reoperation rate. And another site that has uh, similarly uh, high volumes has about half of that reoperation rate. This hospital might learn an enormous amount from that hospital. And so that's the great thing about scope. This information is trans transparently distributed to all participants. And although this site only knows its rate, it can gain from processes that are done at another hospital and secondary benefit to all of the patients all across the state occurs as this number goes down. When these numbers are risk adjusted, I wouldn't worry if I were you, uh, if I were the, this site, because when they get risk adjusted, this number may go down and some of these folks on the zero line may go up. But that's, that's for a, a later forum. The, the, the data right now is not sufficiently mature to allow us to risk adjust, but it is what we were planning to do when the data is ready. <coughs> and then this is also another a place where one hospital, which is, and for hospital administrators who are in the room, this is an important slide. And that's what I'm trying to show here in this smattering of information, is information for each of the stakeholders, not just the physicians, not just the patients. And so this hospital will say, well, we're doing a common surgery, and we have a very long length of stay, and we have relatively high volumes. And this site, which also has representative volumes, is doing the same surgery in half the time. So there's obviously a difference in how things are being done between these two sites. Without spine scope, this hospital would never know what this hospital is doing. But because of spine scope, they will learn, and all of these facilities will improve the way they take care of patients. And that will improve our health care costs. That will, in, that will diminish the suffering that patients have with complications. It'll diminish the ICU stays because best practices will be transparently benchmarked every quarter. And we invite those of you who are interested to attend the forum and watch this data be discussed and interventions generated. So what we do if you look at spine scope in a nutshell is we look at variations. We look at how Different people do the same thing differently and have different outcomes, 
and we put those outcomes against each other to see which one does better and which one does worse, and then we gravitate the entire population across our state toward the best practices that we can benchmark and find. Because all of us don't want to be an outlier. All of us want to show the very best outcomes we can, and so if you are an outlier, you're automatically going back to your facility and say, hey, we've got to change this. And each quarter, as you see, you get closer and closer to a higher and better outcome. Uh, that's just that much more benefit your patients are receiving. Because the data is so robust, because we'll have 4,000 patients, we can embed uh, clinical uh, effectiveness research inside the registry and answer some of the questions which we don't have the answer to now. We don't have the answer to those fusion techniques, but we're going to be able to find it out. We also work with our, our state uh, to uh, help make decision and policymakers and payers to help make decisions about what is appropriate care and what should be covered. And we are uh, trying to uh, get our legislature to stand behind this being a community standard for all patients uh, obtaining spine surgery uh, in our state. Our next steps, you can see our next steps by attending the forum later this afternoon and you're all invited to see that forum in action. Uh, we want to make sure that we get all of the hospitals and uh, engage the ambulatory surgery centers to join in this initiative and in this effort. Our, our personal work, the thing that's on our to-do list, uh, for, whom, uh, for which we have hired staff to get this done, uh, is to increase our PROs so that we can get our patient recorded outcomes on every patient. And lastly, we're engaged in a, a public health initiative that's called uh, Strong for Surgery. And what Strong for Surgery addresses are those modifiable risks that we see our patients come into our offices with that we can change before we go to surgery, uh, improve their diabetes management, uh, improve their uh, nutritional status, so that the patient has the highest likelihood for a beneficial outcome. And if you all are interested, a talk on Strong for Surgery and the components of it and how it can be easily and seamlessly uh, integrated into your practice is going to be uh, given this afternoon at the forum. So we're going to talk about perioperative risk management for spine surgery in patients. My objectives will be um, assessment of cardiac risk and then we're going to talk about risk optimization glucose, anemia, and pain management during spine surgery. So when, we, when an anesthesiologist sees a patient um, and then uh, reviews a clearance for surgery, we don't feel happy about the word clearance. What we want is optimization. Okay, So this is important to differentiate between clearance and optimization. So I'm going to take you through what we mean by that. So uh, preoperative assessment includes the risk, risk stratification, of course, but also accurate documentation, enables the accurate documentation, and optimization of the patient, and initiation of preoperative treatment options, such as beta blockers, antilipids. Some patients might need revascularization, and then um, you know, delay or cancellation surgery for further facilitation of core management options, like diabetic consult or cardiology consult and so on. And then finally, it enables us to decide on the postoperative care where we should send the patient at the end to IC or the floor and what sort of level of treatment uh, options we should provide for the patient. Now, this is adapted from the uh, ACC AHA guidelines and I just sort of modified it to make it simple as possible because a complicated slide but to highlight that emergency surgery, minor intermediate surgery, and elective surgery patients, as long as they meet the low risk medical criteria and can do some stuff, you know, able to do some exercise, more than four meds, they go straight to the OR without further intervention or investigation. High risk surgery patients, I crossed off the spine here, which I will tell you in a moment, and also less than four met patients and active cardiac conditions require some sort of investigations and treatment, which consists of heart rate control and statins before going to OR. So where does the spine surgery fits in the surgical risk category? 
Um, so we have high-risk group, which includes the aortic and other major vascular surgery patients. We have intermediate risk group, carotid endarterectomies and head and neck surgery, prostate surgery, and low risk group, which is skin, breast, cataract surgery, and so on. So orthopedic patients were <laughs> spine included in that group, it's an intermediate group of risk for the surgical risk category uh, with a cardiac risk of one to 5%. So when medicine consult sees a patient, this is where they look at, where they put their patient in, okay? What about the MET? So there's the second criteria. As long as they're climbing a flight of stairs, they're good to go for surgery. Okay, this is the major decision-making step. <coughs> Next. What about the active cardiac conditions? If they have unstable coronary syndromes, uncompensated heart failure, significant arrhythmias, and severe valvular disease, then postponement is required and cardiology consult to evaluate the patient and stabilize it is required before taking the patient for surgery. Now, if you see a patient, and Carlo was talking about, you know, whether we should offer the surgical option or should we delay the surgery, you know, there's some medical consideration in this in terms of patient's chronic diseases. So if you see any of these disease states, ischemic heart disease, congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, chronic renal failure, diabetes and high-risk surgery, and you add up a number of these, so if you have none of it, your perioperative cardiac event risk is 0.4%. If you have three and more of these, you have 11% risk of having some sort of cardiac event during surgery. So this might help you to sort of discuss it with your patient to make a decision whether we should take it to surgery today or give you some more time for non-surgical option and you know, work hard on that a bit more. But most of our patients in Harborview doesn't fit into th this category because we see them quite late, maybe after acute deterioration. So they got some neurological impairment. And they have, their pain have been so difficult to manage so far, so they usually say to us, you know, I would rather die rather than live another day. So when, when, when we tell them about these, you know, it's not very interesting to them. They just want to get it done. Okay, so what we're going to do, so these patients cannot move about. You can't stress them. You can't run them around. So they tell you, I've been sitting in my chair for a month. Is there any markers we can look at? So currently, there is some interest in the brain natriuretic peptides and pro-BNPs and CRPs and serial troponin measurements to predict the post-operative post outcomes. So these are showing some promise, but still it's too early to make recommendations for routine use of these biomarkers. But we have some hope for these. So what about op optimization strategies? I'm going to give you summaries, one or two slides for each one, just to refresh your memories on beta blockers, statins, glucose management, and anemia management. So if your patient is already on beta blocker, just carry on during the perioperative period. If you're going to do a high-risk patient on a high-risk surgery, they need to be on beta blockers. Beta blockers should be started early, minimum two weeks prior to surgery, for two reasons. One, you need to titrate it to a heart rate of 55 to 70, and you should avoid f fluctuations in the blood pressure. So it will need that time to stabilize itself. There's also another benefit for beta blockers, which is it is anti-inflammatory effect. So it doesn't develop acutely, it needs time to sort of produce itself to become anti-inflammatory. So you need that two weeks minimum time prior to surgery. And it should be avoided in low risk, emergent surgery, more than 75 years old, prior CV and sepsis patients. In terms of major cause of perioperative MI, what we know now is the coronary plaque rupture, thrombus formation, and vessel occlusion, these are inflammatory responses, are the major sort of killers or cause of MI in the perioperative period, as opposed to supply demand mismatch. Okay. So we have statins to reduce that inflammation, and they reduce platelet aggregation, improve endothelial vasodilatation, they're anticoagulant, and they stabilize the plug and reduce the rate of uh, perioperative cardiac events. So if the patient is already on them, just carry on. 
And if you have a high-risk medical condition patient, consider starting them. More potent, higher dose, and longer-acting studying is the better. And patients should continue with them indefinitely in the postoperative period. What about glucose? So glucose management in perioperative time has been you know, very intense. And we have done the intense, intensive insulin treatment options <laughs> and failed miserably and causing a lot of problems to our patients in neurocritical care beds. So what about the spine patient? So this is from Goody, uh, just published. It's a review, unfortunately. I can't show you proper numbers or definite numbers to say to you, you should you know, keep the sugar between this and that. But national guidelines at the moment recommend sugar to be kept below 100, 180 uh, milligram per deciliter. Okay? These guys uh, studied on the acute brain and neurosurgical patients and recommended this hundred, between 100 and 150 range. More importantly, hypoglycemia we found more detrimental to the neurological tissue than hyperglycemia and. So intensive insulin treatment patients, when we did studies on them, developed so much hypoglycemic episodes and had increased their morbidity and mortality, that scared us like crazy. So, um, so we said, okay, no more intensive treatment. We need to keep this between these numbers with continuous infusions. And sliding scale is now, now coming off the sort of trend. Rather than doing sliding scale, patients should be on continuous infusions with careful, regular bedside monitoring, so clo closed-loop monitoring systems. So it's very critical. As you know, sugar is not good for you any time during the surgery period. Okay? What about anemia management? Okay, so again, you get your patients to ICU, and ICU management is, you know, consists of sort of uh, hemoglobin of salmon, or six, you know, we, we keep patients a little anemic because their perfusion is better in that state due to blood flow improvement. But I just want to sh sort of explain this graph to you. So this is the lowest hemoglobin being recorded on x-axis, and the top line, the continuous line, shows the beta block patients, and dotted line is the non-beta block patients, and this is the inadvertent sort of difficult cardiac events or, you know, detrimental cardiac events to the patient. So if the patient is on beta blocker, and their hemoglobin reduced 35% from the baseline, their morbidity and mortality increases drastically. Why is that? Because mild to moderate normal volumic hemodilution requires increase in cardiac output. Down to hemoglobin of 9 to 10, cardiac output is compensated by three mechanisms. But if you go down below 9, cardiac output de gets dependent on the heart rate. And if you beta block them, Patient cannot generate that uh, cardiac output for you, hence increase morbidity and mortality. What about pain management? This is my one of just before last slide. This is a complex issue now. We can't just treat patients with opioids. Okay, so this next graph, little interesting. So inflammation, surgery, trauma, whatever you take it, inflammation initiates the NMDA receptor cascade which results in facilitatory system activation, which is a long-lasting effect on pain development. When you give opioid, you expect opioid receptors activation and inhibition of pain development, but it's a short-lasting effect. What we didn't know, opioids create the access too, so NMDAs get activated by just giving opioid to the patient, right? And then that goes in the facilitatory system and pain generation. So we see that in uh, post-operative time in the sort of remifentanil during the surgery, but hyperalgesia in the recovery. Patients requiring more opioids, right? And then chronic pain development. So now pain management requires multi-source approach, not just opioids, but ketamine, magnesium, maybe dexmedetomidine, and that sort of different NMDA inhibitor drugs. and maybe psychotic medication, antipsychiatric medication, like gabapentin. So all this combination needs to be taken into consideration. So perioperative assessment requires optimization and understanding of intraoperative risk, okay? It's not a tick box exercise. Postoperative care is complex and includes multimodal analgesia regimens, 
and anesthesiologists bring value to the system, to the hospital in that regards. Okay, thank you very much. So um, we're going to talk about the role of fusion, where do we stand, and to really focus on degenerative discs. So here's disclosures, really nothing related to this talk, uh, largely institutional support and nothing uh, directly to me. This is the outline I want to try and go over briefly. Uh, first of all, look at what we're not talking about, just to make sure that we're all on the same page of what we're going to be looking at here. Uh, briefly talk about surgical fusion options that will be covered in greater detail this afternoon, and spend the bulk of the time just looking at the literature and what that has to say, and then briefly talk about the heterogeneity of treatment effect and where that may have a role in our decision making with these patients. So first of all, what are we not talking about? We really want to focus here on pure degenerative disc disease. So we don't want to see patients with, we don't want to mix into this baggage uh, patients that have stenosis or where that's a, a, um, a component of this. Uh, we don't want to look at those that have a PARS defect uh, where you're suggestive of instability. Uh, those that have frank instability such as a spondylolisthesis, uh, no deformity, no trauma, and really want to look at pure degenerative disc disease where the leg symptoms are a minor component um, and there's nothing unstable about these particular individuals. We look at surgical fusion options. Uh, we're not going to talk about artificial disc replacements. Uh, that's going to come later on this afternoon with uh, Jens. We have anterior lumbar inner body fusion uh, that can be done from the front. We have posterior base fusions, T-plifts, plifts, plifts uh, posterior lateral, instrumented, uninstrumented, a whole bunch that can be done from a posterior approach. And then 360 degrees where you have a front back approach, maybe minimally invasive from the back, um, open from the front, uh, various kind of combinations of those. And again, I think Michael Lee will talk about these a little bit more this afternoon about what our options are. But really, we want to kind of lump fusions together into a common group. So let's spend the bulk of the time just looking at the literature and what that has to say uh, with respect to this. Really want to focus on uh, most of these articles I think everybody's familiar with to a certain extent. Uh, the article by Fritzell that, that was kind of a landmark article that came out in 2001. Uh, the Brox article out of Norway in 2002. Uh, Jeremy Fairbanks and the UK study in 2005. I will talk briefly about one multi-level um, uh, paper that came out of the Twin Cities group uh, in 2009, and then this review article by Mirza and Deo that uh, we'll look, about, look at last. So let's go back, and I think probably most people are familiar with these, uh, who probably have read them, but uh, let's try and break these down a little bit. So this is really the first one that came out in 2001. It included 294 patients with two-year follow-up. These patients had at least two years of low back pain with degenerative disc disease at L45 or L5S1. They had 222 in the surgical group. Uh, they were lumped into posterior lumbar uh, fusion, uh, posterior lateral fusions, uh, and 360 degree fusions. And then they had a smaller cohort in the non operative group uh, with physical therapy, TENS, acupuncture, cognitive therapy, and various co uh, coping strategies. And they had 98% follow up at two years. So, pretty good uh, for a prospective randomized trial. They looked at a lot of outcomes. They looked at uh, these various things that have been uh, discussed in more detail uh, earlier this morning. And if we break this down and look at these, uh, we can see that the surgical group is really what we see here in this initial column, and we can see that compared to baseline, they really improved on almost everything they measured compared to their baseline to post-op. The non-surgical group did pretty well, though, as w uh, also maybe not quite as well. And if we look at this last column, they look at the difference in p-value um, between the, the surgical and the non-surgical group. So this, again, looks pretty good in favor of surgery. If we look at the back pain scale, we can see that, again, this top line here is the, the non-surgical group. The surgical group did better, and that was statistically significant uh, with respect to that. If we look at the leg pain, uh, again, most of these are genitive disc disease, so I think we have to look at this a little bit with a bit of a guarded eye. Uh, we're looking at leg pain. Uh, they did better, uh, and this was statistically uh, different between the surgical group and the non-surgical group. Interestingly, if you look at this uh, chart from their table or this table from their uh, study, they look at the overall rating after surgery, and we can see in the surgical group that we have about, I don't know, 60% of patients here uh, that, that did well, uh, much better or better, but that also means that we have an, an additional 40% here that really were unchanged or worse. So I think, you know, that is something that we have to leave open to interpretation. Do we really want to be doing a, a, a procedure that only has a 60% success rate at the expense and complications? Likewise, we can see here in the non-surgical group they didn't do as well, and their conclusion was 63% improved in the surgery group versus 29% in the non-operative group, and that was statistically significant. Their conclusion in their article is that we conclude that lumbar fusion can be used to reduce pain and decrease disability in carefully selected patients suffering from chronic low back pain. So this is really the first one that kind of came to light in 2001, uh, suggested that maybe we as surgeons have a role here. This Brock study that came out the year after, um, they actually had two, they had two studies, one in 2003, one in 2006. If we look at their first study, they had 64 patients, so a smaller group, only one year of low back pain versus two years. 
again at L4.5 and L5S1. 37 were placed in the fusion group. 27% uh, were in a modern rehab program, much more aggressive than the other study with three daily physical therapy sessions. They only did one year follow up instead of two year, but they again had 98%, or pardon me, 97% follow up. If we look at their outcome, their main outcome they looked at was ODI. They looked at the shuttle uh, walking test and a few other uh, uh, outcomes as well. Uh, and their conclusion that they had a 76% success with surgery, 70% success with cognitive inter intervention and exercises. Here's a graph from their chart. We can see that essentially these are going side by side, really no difference between fusion and uh, a rehab program. And they concluded uh, differently than, um, than the Fritzell study that the main outcome measure showed equal improvement in patients with chronic low back pain and disc degeneration randomized to cognitive intervention and exercises or lumbar fusion. So really no difference between these two. So then moving on, we have the Fairbank article that came out of uh, the UK. Uh, they had 349 participants, 173 were placed in rehab, 176 in surgery. And interestingly, the surgery was left to the discretion of the surgeon. And so I think this, so we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later and how this may be a confounding variable here. Their follow-up was not as good. They had 81% follow-up at 24 months. Uh, 15 hospitals participated and uh, a number of surgeons as well. So if we look at their outcome, we can see here, here's the surgery, uh, here's their 24-month uh, ODI, here's the rehab, here's their 24-month ODI, and we can see that really there's a slightly statistically significant difference here, uh, better for surgery compared to rehab. However, if we look at the shuttle walking test, the SF36, uh, really no difference between these two groups. So how do we weigh this out? So again, they, they state very clearly in their results, ODI improves slightly more in favor of surgery. No other difference between groups and any other outcome. And they suggest that clinically this difference is small considering the potential risk and additional costs of surgery. Their conclusion, no clear evidence emerged that primary spinal fusion surgery was any more beneficial than intensive rehabilitation. So how do these studies add up? Because they clearly come up with different conclusions. And what are the flaws within these? Well, if we break these down, I think in the Swedish group, the control group was really given unstructured therapy. They weren't set into anything specific. It was kind of a continue what you're doing and see how you turn out. The data also excludes patients who crossed over, and so that kind of leaves a little bit of question as far as um, uh, how do we take their conclusions. The Brock study out of Norway, they had a much smaller sample size, so that begs the question, is it powered sufficiently to really come up with any sufficient conclusions? They also had a wide confidence interval for advantage of surgery, again, probably due to the small sample size. If we look at the UK study, they had a high dropout rate, they had a high crossover rate. They also, I think, wrongly included those with spondylolisthesis in 11% of patients, and 15% uh, of the patients that were treated with surgery actually had non-fusion treatment. So they underwent decompressions, they underwent other things uh, that probably shouldn't be lumped in the same category if we're really looking for the role of fusion here. Here's one study we'll talk briefly about. This was a, a study looking at three or more motion levels. This is out of the Twin City group in Minneapolis. They had a retrospective study of 80 patients, 360 degree fusions, to try and assess whether, we don't know about one or two levels, what about a three level or more. They looked at the SF36, the S Oswestry, and the Roland Morris. If we look at this, they had an 81% fusion rate. Their ODI was statistically improved uh, compared to the baseline. The Roland Morris was statistically improved, and the SF36 was uh, improved. So if we look at this here, we can see on our Roland Morris here, this is statistically different compared to baseline to a final outcome at two years. The Oswestry is better baseline compared to two years. If we look at our SF36, we can see it's statistically different across all of these with the exception of the mental composite here in the last column. They concluded that the surgical treatment of lumbar degenerative disc disease by 360 degree fusion should be considered for properly selected patients. And we see this kind of theme coming up over and over again, the properly selected. Careful patient selection is essential to achieve satisfactory results. This is a retrospective study. There's no comparison groups. So we don't know how these patients would have done if randomized to uh, conservative uh, options. Let's look at this article, and I think if you haven't read this article, I think it's a very good article that kind of brings all these studies together. Uh, this was done by uh, Soho Mirza Rick Dayo, uh, classically known probably as conservative uh, individuals. They came up with five randomized trials, of which they excluded one, and they looked at the Fritzell that we talked about, the Brock's two articles, and the Fairbanks article, um, and again came up with their various conclusions from this. Again, the flaws that we've, some of the flaws we've talked about, the Fritzell study did not report uh, data according to intent to treat principles. The Brox is underpowered. The Fairbanks high rate of crossover greater than 20% and loss of follow-up about 20%. If you look at this, they break this down into the various columns. So we can see the design of these. Uh, we can see the year they were published. We can see how many uh, centers were involved. We can see the number of surgeons. We can see where the funding came from that obviously is important in today's day and age the age, the follow-up. So they kind of break this down very nicely, a lot of these issues we've already talked about. 
Now, interestingly, if you look at this comparison and say we have the Fritzel, we have the Brox, we have the Fairbanks, here's the sur surgery group here. We can see that in Fritzel's study, he recommends surgery. They had a 24.5% improvement. Actually, better improvement in the Brox group and better improvement in the Fairbanks group, but they came up with different conclusions. The reason being is if we look at the non-operative group, Fritzell is 24.5 versus 5.8 percent, whereas here we have 37 percent versus 30 percent, and here 26 versus 20 percent. So really, the difference here is really that the Brox group and the Fairbanks group are doing better with the conservative um, option than the Fritzell study here, and therefore the difference in conclusion. They conclude from this and uh, this review that all four trials suggest that any advantage of surgery over non-surgical care is modest, on average near or below the minimally important change in the disability score. They do say, giving, I think, Fritzell credit, that compared to unstructured non-operative care, lumbar fusion surgery may be more efficacious than uh, unstructured non-surgical care. So let's talk, we kind of have a, a bit of an overview here. What about the heterogeneity of treatment effect? And I think this is a topic that uh, is becoming a little bit more popular over the last few years. What is this? Well, we see the same treatment that can produce different results in different patients. And I think this kind of goes back to William Osler's statement, if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might as well be a science and not an art. So we recognize that, and, and as was discussed earlier, that there's psychological factors that come into play. There's other social factors, other medical factors that come into play here. If we look at heterogeneity of treatment effect, we can have a quantitative effect where both do well. So suppose here we have the fusion group, and they do better than the no fusion group, but they both get better. Maybe that's what's going on here. We can also have a qualitative effect where maybe this is going on, where the, fusion, the no fusion group, they're actually getting worse, and the fusion group are getting better, so therefore they're going different directions. So subgroup effects may vary in different directions. This uh, recently came out in an article. This came out in uh, 2011. Uh, they looked at two studies uh, trying to assess the heter heterogeneity of treatment effect with the uh, impact of various uh, medical issues. And they found here, if you break this down, this is two publications. One of these is the Fairbanks article. And if you look here, this top line here is the non-smoker. And we can see the confidence interval here. It favors fusion versus the smoker. They're barely getting above kind of a break even here with the overall effect being somewhere in between. So is there a role that maybe we should be doing fusions and non-smokers and we shouldn't be doing fusions and smokers? So their conclusion from their study was that non-smokers may be more likely to have a favorable surgical fusion outcome in, in chronic low back pain patients. So again, they don't say that we should therefore be doing it, but I think this is something to weigh into mind. They also say in their key points, and if we look at this top line here, when comparing surgical fusion to non-operative management, the treatment benefit, benefit favoring fusion is greater in non-smokers than smokers. So obviously what we're trying to find here is the greatest overlap. We want to find the patient that has pain, disability, pathological abnormalities that we can see on imaging, and social and psychological status that all come together to create this perfect storm, and maybe there is some group of patients that are going to do well with surgery. So I think in conclusions, we know that we have lots of options and ways to do fusions, and that'll be talked about later by Mike. We know that some patients seem to do well with the fusion, and others do not. Uh, we saw that kind of throughout these articles, that certainly patients did well with fusions. The, the issue is maybe they're doing equally well with other procedures, and clearly not all of them are doing well. We need to continue to strive to find out which patients we can make better and which ones we cannot. I think this is important uh, for the good of our patients, obviously, first and foremost, but also as we face incre increasing scrutiny from insurance companies and various other groups that are trying to uh, control what we're doing here. If we can find out which, which patients are going to do well, we may have some say in this. I think the heterogeneity treatment effect seems to be a real issue, and I think as uh, we move forward, we'll probably get more information with respect to these. So I think in conclusion, the role of fusion in patients with degenerative disc disease, I think it's still a very unsolved issue. Certainly some patients seem to do well, certainly some do not. We need to find out where this comes together. Thank you. Thank you.